Our club's always been a forum for visionaries, public figures, and decision makers to command attention to the issues of our time and inform the most relevant, compelling, and challenging conversations. Here we offer first-person access to dynamic political, business, and public personality. The Canadian Club is one of the most important podiums anywhere in the world that a Canadian can speak to, tell Canadians what it is that they think, develop those thoughts. And so I want to thank you for that very, very much. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists today. Through our programs and events, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, our joint events, and our media and social media opportunities, we offer you access to dynamic political, social, and business figures from abroad and right here at home. The platform from which the eloquence of Canada has flowed all of that time, whether it be business, education, politics, sports, arts and culture. If someone wants to say something to Canadians about this country and about the future of this country, this is the venue you choose. Good afternoon again. My name is Glenn Parkinson, president of Canadian Club Toronto and your host for this evening, or this afternoon. It may not go to this evening, I hope it, uh, we're a little, we're usually pretty good at running on time. <laughs> um, and a special welcome to those of us joining us online at canadianclub.org. Our lineup of events is made possible thanks in large part due to the support of our sponsors. And today's event is sponsored by KPMG, so a round of applause to thank them. Please. We also thank our season sponsor, Canadian Bankers Association, and our annual airline partner, Air Canada. Now our event today, and in fact our entire season, is carbon neutral, thanks to our partnership with Canada's Forest Trust Corporation. Fostering sustainable forestry practices, I, it, it's worthy of an applause, but I'll give you just a few, okay, yep. <laughs> and, we should all know more about Canada's Trust, Forest Trust Corporation, fostering sustainable forestry practices, but also connecting Canadians to more closely with nature. So our partnership, and we've had a partnership with them for a number of years, together we're compensating for the carbon impact of today's event, but also running a, creating a green legacy for tomorrow. So thank you, CFT, for planting a forest and maintaining it and sustaining it for future generations on our behalf. It's also my pleasure to welcome a table of young leaders from the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, supported by the Business Council of Canada. And we always enjoy all of our student leader tables, but the, the Monk tables in particular are terrific because they ask a lot of great questions. <laughs> we can always count on them for terrific questions. Um, so if you look on the center of your table, you'll see there are question cards and pens. So if during our discussion, the spirit so moves you to ask a question, please just write it down and hold up your hand and we'll run the question up to our moderator. Similarly, for those of you online, on the right-hand side of your screen, there's a submit question button. So you'll be able to click submit your question and in the same way, we'll bring your question up to the front. At this time, I'd like to welcome Elio Luongo, CEO and senior partner for KPMG Canada to introduce our speakers today, Elio. Well, good afternoon, and uh, thanks very much for in the introduction, Glenn, and a big thank you to all of you uh, for joining us today as we discuss the topic of great significance, one that holds the key to Canada's future prosperity and global standing in the years ahead. For many, when they think of Canada, they think of the abundant natural resources, they reflect on the beauty of the Canadian Rockies and the expansive coastline of the, uh, uh, the longest coastline of any country in the world. But for me, they're forgetting about Canada's greatest element and asset, and that is of its people and its culture. Home to about 40 million individuals, Canada boasts a wealth of world-class innovative talent, 
with a commitment to inclusivity that sets it apart in the business world and on the global stage. And when harnessed effectively, it's easy to see why Canada ranks alongside the likes of other economic giants, some even twice our size. However, in today's uncertain world, potential alone is not enough. And to ensure Canada's collective strengths and benefits everyone, we need strong leadership, dedicated partners, and a clear vision for the future. Which is why I'm so thrilled to be here with you today. And at KPMG, we believe in commitments that inspire confidence, empower change, and drive innovation. We believe that when we work together and lead by example at all levels of the organizations, we can create new opportunities, deliverable, deliver actionable insights, and drive impact for better. This belief extends to Canada's broader economic success. And while leadership can be seen as a catalyst for transformation, requiring the courage to make tough decisions when faced with challenges, partnerships from everyone involved is equally critical. As a multicultural nation, harnessing our diversity is a tremendous strength, but no easy feat. We need to continually foster collaboration between government, industry, academia, and our communities to tackle complex issues and improve the lives and livelihood of all Canadians. And in order to achieve this, we need to have a clear vision for the future, a roadmap to success. It requires the setting of ambitious goals and aligning our efforts towards achieving them at all costs. And only by working together, we can create a thriving ecosystem that supports economic growth and prior prioritizes social and environmental responsibility. Today, we'll hear from two prominent business leaders who will highlight the top priorities the federal government should address in the upcoming fall economic statement, followed by a discussion around sustainable economic growth solutions. Events like this one, where the very best business leaders are together under one roof, discussing pressing topics through open dialogue, open dialogue and collaboration is vital. The keys to Canada's economic greatness are in our hands, but it's up to us, all the leaders, to ensure the right fit for the benefit of Canadians. And with that, I'd like to formally introduce our speakers today, events starting with Goldie Hyder, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Business Council of Canada. Goldie's illustrious career involves serving as the Director of Policy and Chief of Staff to the Right Honourable Joe Clark, former Prime Minister and leader of the Federal Progressive Conservative Party followed by his two-decade two tenure with Hill and Knowlton Strategies, where he served four years as President and CEO before joining the Business Council of Canada in 2018. As a dedicated member of the community, Goldie has also served on several charity and non-for-profit organizations in various capacities. Joining Goldie is Annette Vercheron, Chair and CEO of Northstar, and prior to that, uh, uh, Annette was the Vice President of Development for Amasco, President and Co-Owner of Michaels Canada, as well as the President of the Home Depot of Canada. She is an active member on many corporate boards, really slowing down it seems, Annette. Um, <laughs> Post-Chair of, Ontan of Ontario Energy Associ uh, Association, she is the Chair of Mars Discovery District Board, Chair of uh, the NSDTC, She's on the board of Air Canada, the board of Liberty Mutual, the board of CNRL, and the board of Saputo. Really slowing down in it, really taking it easy. I like that. She is also a companion of the Canadian Business Hall of Fame and was named as an officer to the Order of Canada for contributions to the retail industry and the corporate social responsibility. Please join me in welcoming Goldie and Annette to the stage. Why isn't Canada an economic giant? That was the question that the UK-based Financial Times asked last month. It argued that Canada's proximity to the United States and to our other natural competitive advantages should make us an economic powerhouse. 
And yet the article said, few, few ever talk about us in those terms. Now, I actually disagree with the article. I think Canada is an economic giant. The problem is, the giant is asleep. Our considerable competitive advantages have lulled us into a sense of complacency. We've become content with good enough. We have lost the drive the, to build big things, to celebrate our successes, to work towards a common vision of prosperity for ourselves and the generations to follow. Annette and I are here to deliver a wake-up call. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to outline a number of things that we can do to shake ourselves out of this complacency and awaken the Canadian economic giant. These ideas address three key topics. First, making the most of our natural resources. Second, leveraging our relationship with the United States. And third, the need for fiscal responsibility. So let me start with the first point, Canada's natural resources. To my mind, awakening our economic giant means championing major projects that stand to benefit all Canadians. This is especially true as we work with urgency on our energy transition. If, if we are actually committed to reducing carbon emissions, we need to get projects approved, and we need to get them built on time. We need expanded electricity grids, access to critical mineral deposits, improved infrastructure corridors, and much more as we work towards a net zero future. Last week, Supreme Court of Canada ruling on the Impact Assessment Act, um, otherwise known as Bill C-69 for you CPAC watchers, uh, highlights the needs for clear national vision for how we develop and approve major projects in Canada. Now, we need to get this right. We need to get this right. We cannot have bad unconstitutional policy replaced with bad constitutional policy. Now is the time for the federal government to make good on the commitment it made in Budget 2023 to speed up the permitting process for major national projects. You see, other countries, they're not waiting for us to figure it out. They're moving on. They're forging ahead. The United States and Europe, European Union, are finally finalizing plans to drastically reduce permitting timelines for some projects. Businesses are actively investing in new clean energy projects. Take, for example, the Pathways Alliance. It's a great example of private sector companies coming together to achieve net zero emissions in Canada's oil sands. But Pathways and other projects are waiting. They're waiting for clarity at the federal government on the way forward. Now that includes details on the tax credits promised in the spring budget that are meant to de-risk potential investments. This again is an example of Canada being asleep while other countries are fully awake. Right now, right now, tax incentives in the United States are attracting clean energy projects from around the world, and that includes from Canadian companies. So we need to wake up. We need to get moving on our own projects. Now, key to that will be the relationships and partnerships we have with our Indigenous people. And it's why the Business Council continues to call on the federal government to backstop loans on Indigenous investors so that they can fully participate in projects of their choosing, of their choosing, on their own terms. And on that note, beyond loan guarantees, frankly, there is much more. There is much more we can and should be doing to advance Indigenous reconciliation in this country with significant greater urgency. It's something I know that Annette feels as strongly about as I do. Now let me move to the second point. Our close relationship with the United States is just one of our greatest competitive advantages. So just think about all that we share. The longest undefended border, strong and enviable personal ties, 
a manufacturing base that is so integrated that products often cross the border multiple times before they're actually built. And yet here too, here too I fear that we have become a little too complacent. We should never, we should never take our relationship with the United States for granted. And make no mistake, our international reputation is directly tied to how healthy our relationship is with our number one neighbor and trading partner. When President Joe Biden spoke to Canada's parliament in March, he identified three shared responsibilities, prosperity, security, and values. When it comes to prosperity, we need to live up to the commitments. Frankly, all sides need to live up to the commitments that we have made in the Canada-US-Mexico agreement. That is how we're going to ensure the vitality and the competitiveness of North America. When it comes to security, our countries must work together to protect our people and our economies from those who seek to do us harm. Economic security is national security. Just yesterday, I was at Stanford University for an unprecedented meeting with the heads of all Five Eyes intelligence agencies in collaboration with the private sector, academia, and others. Security is a partnership. It is a shared responsibility, and it has to be taken very seriously. And when it comes to shared values, we need to stand up for democracy and the rule of law, and we need to live up to our international commitments. Now to my third point, fiscal discipline. Awakening our economic giant requires us to have our fiscal house in order. Our federal debt has more than doubled over the last three years. Let me repeat that. Imagine your personal debt doubling over the last three years. Our federal debt has doubled, more than doubled, over the last three years. Public charges are up 23% year over year. We just simply cannot keep spending money that we don't have. It's just math. It's just math. So we continue to urge the federal government to adopt a realistic, a realistic fiscal anchor, specifically the one advocated by former Bank of Canada Governor David Dodge, that would simply limit servicing costs, our interest payments, to a maximum of 10% of revenue so we can ensure that we can live within our means. So this week, I wrote to Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Christian Freeland, outlining the priorities that business leaders have and that we believe she must address when she brings about her fall economic statement expected sometime next month. And it wouldn't surprise you that fiscal responsibility tops that list. You see, if we want to ensure that we have the same or better standards of living for our children that we've been able to enjoy, that we've been very privileged to enjoy, it's not possible if we saddle them with mountains of debt. On a personal level, we're all working hard to not leave our children behind with the mortgage. But yet here, we're doing exactly that. I recently saw a public opinion poll in which a whopping 65%, 65% of respondents believe that the next generation of Canadians will have a lower standard of living. I'm deeply saddened by that. Shame on us. But here's the good news. I truly believe that we can change that. I truly believe we can change that. We can change it by embracing a long-term economic growth strategy that simply plays to our strengths and that begins now. Not tomorrow, now. And this, this event itself is intended to be a call to action for all of us. You see, it's too easy to just stand up here and talk about what government can do. My question is, what can you do? What can we do? What must we do? So whether you're in the federal government or the provincial government or in a territorial government or municipal governments, big business, small business, medium business, medium-sized businesses, labor unions, indigenous people, civil society in every region of this country needs to come together. 
And that is why, two years ago, the Business Council helped to establish the Coalition for a Better Future, very ably led by my friends Anne McClellan and Lisa Raitt. It brings together more than 100 different organizations from across this full spectrum of civil society to advocate for inclusive and sustainable economic growth. The message is simple. We're in this together, so we need to work together. We need to wake up. We need to embrace our strengths and celebrate our successes. And it begins with rallying around a common vision of prosperity for our country that supports, that supports and champions Canadian innovation, that ensures that all workers have the skills needed to succeed in the new economy, that is proud, that is proud of businesses that grow from small firms into large enterprises so that we can have the size and the scale to compete with our competition and the very best in the rest of the world. Now let me tell you, as passionate as I am about these issues and the need to achieve Canada's unrealized potential, Annette is arguably more so. A respected business leader, a serial entrepreneur, Annette has made a career of speaking truth to power. And it's my pleasure now to join her for what I hope will be an informative discussion and one which we invite you to engage in. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. Are you ready? Are, yeah, well, oh. now the fun stuff, unscripted. All right, here we go. Okay. okay. <laughs> this is where the staff gets nervous. Um, look, I said a lot of things. Yep. Uh, I tried to keep it brief, but any reaction? I, uh, my reaction is um, the attitude that I've always taken in everything that I've done, um, and it's ownership. And uh, I think that your, this speech talks about us taking ownership and not relying so much on government uh, and, and really uh, taking a stand. And I think, I think your three areas uh, you know, the relationship that I've had with the United States has been very strong all these years. Natural resources, I'm extraordinarily uh, focused on that, and so are companies around this country. And we need more clarity in terms of, you know, moving forward. But at the same time, we need to take great, greater risks. Um, I'll tell you, on the boards that I'm on, uh, Goldie, the biggest issue is now geopolitical is becoming a bigger, bigger issue. The impact of supply chain, the impact uh, uh, on all kinds of trade issues relative to the, what's happening in the Middle East and what's about to happen is quite, uh, quite scary. Um, climate change is a big, uh, big issue. Um, ESG generally has become uh, a big issue. Um, I think everybody's concerned about uh, the next number of years. Innovation and talent how we, I think one of the biggest challenges Canada has is engaging its people to become more productive and have greater ownership in the businesses that they're in. And we're not going, we're not asking our people more aggressively enough to participate in, uh, in how to uh, manage things. When I was running Home Depot, I was just one cog in the wheel of this great organization. And I remember Arthur Blank saying to me, and at 50 stores max, in my interview I said 100 stores minimum. <laughs> and he looked at me and he says, you're out of your mind. And I said, no I'm not. And uh, I remember calling Arthur at the 179th store that we opened. And uh, this team, uh, and, 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 and Mike Rowe, he digs deep, he gets closer to the customer, closer to the people that are impacted, and he drives change. We never relied on the government much. We just drove and, and built our businesses. So I think, and another example would be, in, you know, I've got my uh, great friend John Beck here. Um, seven years ago, energy storage, there was no market for energy storage in, in Canada. And um, so we, little team of 16, decided we're gonna create that market. We went to the government and said, look, we need a pathway to get this thing done. Let us develop a pathway. 
We'll have, we'll have, we'll have uh, gateways and we'll make sure that we do this economically and responsibly. And we had people like John Beck, uh, who worked with us in construction. Um, it was almost an impossible project to get done. Three times it almost collapsed. And we kept fighting and we got it done. And we created a market now of 4,000 megawatts of energy storage capacity. RFPs are going out today as a result of that. A biggest project Tesla has ever built is being built uh, uh, in Ontario. Um, it's a matter of fact, biggest single project in North America with our partners at first six nations of the Grand River. And, and it can be done. It can be done. It can be done. So we're, we need to take risks. We need to charge ahead more. We need bigger aspirations. We really do, Goldie, as a, as a people. I know that your parents and you came to this country because you thought this was the best country in the world. And so do I. We're both immigrants. We, we're, you know, we are, we've come to this country and many of the, in this room are. And that spirit- I think we all are. I think we all are, aren't we? Going huh? back. So, so tell me a little bit about your journey. Well, look, I think, I think what's important here is that the, when you come to Canada, you, you come to achieve your own objectives and your own dreams and your own family's ambitions, but you come because you believe the country is working to improve itself in its, in its own place. And there is no greater country in Canada. What we do here in Canada, what we have here in Canada, it is special. But we've gotten comfortable. Yeah. We've gotten really comfortable. And I tell you, immigrants in particular who come here, more often than not come here for economic reasons. Yep. And they'd come here to create uh, an opportunity for their families, to provide them education, to provide them an opportunity to work and to contribute and to make life better and, and, and improve in that journey. You know, it saddens me that we're actually, like, and I know there's a table here from Monk, and, and I love going to speak with young people, but I, more often than not, I start off with an apology. I, I tell them I'm here to say sorry on behalf of my generation, uh, many of you in this room, um, that we screwed it up that we're the first generation in the history, in history, to actually leave behind a society worse than we found it. Whether you talk about the climate, whether you talk about our fiscal uh, situation, whether you talk about our geopolitical situation with wars, whether you talk about our crumbling infrastructure, and they get, I don't want to depress them, but the point is to say, this is on us. Yeah. But we also need your help. In many ways, you're like an immigrant now. You have to think entrepreneurially. You need to help us get the rules and the regulations and the, the, the environment, the investment environment and the regulatory environment right, because it's still not too late. I'm not here to say it's over. I'm here to say we can do better. Yes, we can. And I think that's the story of, of immigrants, but it's the story of all of us now, because the world is changing. Yeah. And it's what I see, as I travel a lot, is um, a hunger that exists around the world to compete to take advantage of whatever that's been afforded them. You know, I always use the example of Germany, Japan, and Korea. Three countries that have nothing in the ground. Yeah. Nothing, okay? All of whom were sadly, in many cases, obliterated to the ground. Okay? They had no choice but to say, what do we want to be when we grow up? Mm -hmm. The adversity created the hope and the opportunities to say, we need to have an industrial policy. I just say an economic growth strategy. What do we want to be? What are we good at? Some said, I want to be the world's leading you know, advanced manufacturing. Others said, I want to make the best electronics. Someone else said, I want to make the best cars. And in less than one generation, they've done it. Yeah. So if you have nothing and you can achieve, imagine what you can do with what we have. We have it all. Every single one of our provinces has some form of natural resources that it's rich in. You know, we have the human talent, we have the most open society, we have a multiculturalism, we have an immigration policy, and we won the geographic lottery. Yeah. You should not be playing the hand as poorly as we are with all that, that, that we have. And so that's what is keeping a lot of people in the business community up at night, because capital is mobile. It is. It is. And, it it and doesn't more of have a nationality, unfortunately. It goes to where it's welcome. Exactly, exactly. And I'm seeing that. I'm seeing investment concerns, um, you know, uh, to some degree, they're still pushing hard, all the entrepreneurs. You know, my work at Mars, my work at STTC, I see these amazing companies working to scale up in the clean tech sector, particularly. And it is, 
but it, we don't talk about this enough. We don't talk about our successes enough. We talk about the big... Well, I'd say the opposite. I'd say we rip down the successful a little too much. Yeah. We should be celebrating size and scale as yes. an achievement. What, this country is full of innovators. It is built on innovation. All these you know, big companies that are here today were small companies. And we do not focus enough because, it, to me, what companies are concerned about is improving their productivity. How do they do that without innovation? Um, how do they move forward uh, and compete in this world? We are, we are trade leaders. Uh, we need to really drive, I believe, our value-added industries, our manufacturing industries, our, uh, our, our uh, you know, look, we're the best in the world in AI, but we're losing ground. We seem to start things really well, really well, and then give it up. The average company, right, Young? The average company, once it gets a 20 million evaluation, they usually sell. Time to buy a cottage. <laughs> yeah, and to buy a cottage. What is it that we have to change that? We have to want to win. You know, Own the Podium was an example that, that Goldie and I talk about. And I remember when that came out, you know, that's very aggressive, Own the Podium. Guess what? We own the podium, that Olympics. 40%. 40 of the, of the 100 people won medals that we really focused on. We need to be more performance-based and driven, driven to, uh, because the protection of this company is economic. It's the success of the economic environment, and we need to own it. And we talk too much about things that, we talk too much, in my opinion, and I don't think we do enough. And I, I have this, this chapter in my book that says, my, my style has always been, Think of something, get to 60%, and then go. I take the risk, I go. I pivot along the way, I make it right eventually. But if you don't go, if you don't take that risk, you lose. Because there's 100 other people in other countries uh, taking you out. And so these are things that I think we can own. We really can. And, and you know, in natural resources, Oh my God, when, you know, Giles, when I think about the auto industry, when that discussion started, right? We we're gonna lose the auto industry because electrification was happening. And all I'm thinking about is mineral. Critical minerals. All I'm thinking about is minerals. I'm a miner, I started my career in the coal mining business. Do you believe that? In Cape Breton, first nine years of my life. I knew I had to get out. <laughs> then, it eventually got out 10 years later, but, but I'll tell you, I'm thinking minerals. And so we, all we, we have these great EV battery plants coming, but I'm more concerned about the value added that they can create. We, we are not good at connecting the dots, developing the network, long-term, long-term thinking. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, what an opportunity we have. We have such a major opportunity in our country, but we can't let it slip. It takes 15 years to get a permit done. And everybody said to me, and that you can't get a deal done with the indigenous people. Well, I've got about five or six going now. And it's how you change your attitude about how you think about this. And we are the ones that need to adjust because we don't have it right. And I listen to my young people. I listen to these kids that tell me I'm full of shit. <laughs> and I take it. And I listen to, listen to the senior leaders of the, of the country. I listen to everybody. But we're not finding ways to take action aggressively enough. We're not. And this is the greatest democracy in the world. And we're going to lose ground. We're going to lose ground if we don't really take action more aggressively. I'm totally off script, Goldie. I'm sorry. Uh, let me get back to the question. No, but I'll just pick up, I'll pick up on what you said. I'll pick up on what you said because the question people ask is, so what actions do we need to yeah. take? And for, too often we blame, again, someone else. Well, someone else. Right? It's the, it's the trade agreements. It's, na it's uh, WTO. It's uh, yep. United Nations. It's Donald Trump. Yep. And we have a yep. reason to blame someone else. I think we're a country that puts the puck in its own net. <laughs> right? Yeah. We put the puck in our own net. It's like, like you're skating up and the poor goalie all of a sudden sees his own team turn around and shoot at him. What's going on here? 
right? What are interprovincial trade barriers? Yeah. Do you know how many times I've had to explain that to a, a high commissioner or an ambassador from another country, especially ones with whom we have trade agreements who say, uh, we have a free trade agreement with you. Yeah. We have members, of, we have businesses from our countries investing in your country. They've come to me and asked me what these things are. Yeah. Great question. What the heck are those? Yeah. Why do they still exist? How come we as customers, as Canadians, are okay with the idea yeah. that we're going to be charged more from things we sell to each other, yeah. <laughs> but we want it less from sites? Absurd. Yeah. And yet they're still here. They're still here. How are we going to be a trading economy with the demand for our natural resources? We have the number one potash company in the world here. Yeah. We have the uranium companies here. Every product that we have, forestry, agriculture, food, fertilizer, Fish. it's all in high demand, yeah. energy. Don't even get me going on that one, it's an Albertan, right? We, they, everywhere I go, people say, you have what we want, yeah. what we need. Yeah. Right? But you know what we're having trouble doing? We're having trouble expanding our infrastructure. Yeah. I say in my remarks often that if Canada were discovered today, there wouldn't be a Canada there would be at least 10 Canadas and three territories. Yeah. We would not have a national highway. We wouldn't be able to build it. There, the, the regulations alone would prevent us from figuring out how to do that. There definitely wouldn't be a railway. Right? We wouldn't be a country if we were founded today. So here we are, 150 plus years into our journey. We've, we've had great success getting to where we are, but we're falling asleep, as I've mentioned, and not just me, <laughs> the Financial Times and others abroad have said that. But where's the infrastructure? Expanding our ports, yeah. expanding our roads, our bridges, our airports, yeah. the things that move people and move products around, we're unable to do. You can't blame anybody for that uh, but ourselves. And I think, Goldie, one thing we don't talk, and so, you know, I come from the East Coast, and so the fishery industry is so important to us. We have the, we've got the most uh, coastlines in all of the world. Uh, we are the food basket of the world. We have so much opportunity to produce these products better, more efficiently, uh, uh, with greater, less impact on climate change. Uh, we, we have everything. And we got the most talented, educated people in the world. So. And access to 1.5 billion people with our trade. We have customers. Yeah, They're ready-made waiting for us to get a marsh. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So what's stopping us? We are. Uh, I think we are. I think that's the message, and I'm hoping that your questions of us will touch on some of these, these things, because um, we elect our governments, and governments will come and governments will go, and there'll be you know, one stripe or another yeah. stripe, but they have to do what we want them to do. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we asking for the right things? Yeah. How much of our time is spent on the small ball, as I call it, worrying about the weekend? Yeah. <laughs> you know, my dad likes to say the definition of long-term planning in Canada is, what are you doing this weekend? Yeah. Um, there are countries out there thinking what they're doing for the next 50 to 100 years. That's right, that's right. right? And what is our vision? Yeah. And let me say one thing. If you lose this moment, it may not come back. No, that's right. It may not come back. We should be, the, the, the coalition has three priorities. We need a long-term economic growth strategy. We need to lead the world on the, on the transition, the energy transition, because it's yeah. the energy and the environment. It's not either or, it's yeah. both. Yeah. Okay? And we have the resources to do it. And finally, we need to address inequality in our society. These are noble, these are all the right things to be talking about. Governments are starting to listen, yeah. but I think we need to have a much louder voice as citizens to say, yes, I'm worried about my pothole. Yeah. You know, yes, I'm worried about my healthcare system and education system. Yeah. But we have to realize that without a growing economy, yeah. all of those things are gonna get worse, not better. Yeah. Because you cannot debt finance your way to prosperity. Yeah. You actually have to grow your economy. And we need to talk more like that. We have been sidetracked on the social side of the ledger, we have, yeah. and we have to bring back the economic side of the ledger because it is math. Yeah. You can't run from it. That's right. When, when I grew up on the farm and uh, we lost quota or we had a bad season, hay season, man, we ate less. It was really easy to understand. We are, so think of what Goldie said, Think of twice of your debt in your family doubling in three years. What the heck? And we're just sitting here, right? And we're accepting it. And we shouldn't. And 
and I'll tell you, Canada is known as a great place to invest, but it's getting, when there's change in policy, fundamental change in policy, investors really get scared. Really get scared. And you know, I see the, the financial guys and the uh, firms uh, nodding their head, uh, but they really get scared, and we are scaring off investors. They say money follows message. It, it right. does. Yeah. And we, we yeah, ask we the are, questions from yeah, the audience. Exactly. I want to make sure we give them some yeah. hope okay. too, because that's, it's, we do. that's part of the agenda here. Yes. It's not to, not to like but feed you this, and depress I, you, but to <laughs> I think it is all about hope. I do. How do we ensure our innovators and entrepreneurs that their efforts will remain secure in Canada and growing external risks? I think we got to scale up a lot of these companies way faster. To be brutally honest, we just go so damn slow. Um, and uh, pacing is really important, and we are risk averse and need to get more aggressive. Wouldn't you say that, Young? Yes. I, I would just add, though, that, that you know, I often say that governing is hard. Uh, governments do have to make choices. Like, we can't be all things to all people. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. amongst those, we have to, I hate to say it this way, but there will be winners and there will be losers. Exactly. We need to make sure we pick That's right. the winners as opposed to spreading it all out like peanut butter exactly. across the country and we get average. Yep. We shouldn't celebrate average, we should promote success. Exactly. And that comes with saying, we're gonna double down on, yeah. AI is a great yeah. example. Montreal, Waterloo, yeah. University of Alberta and Edmonton. Yeah. World leaders, yeah. world leaders. But it won't last if you don't invest in it. Exactly. If you don't create the conditions for more capital to form right. behind that. Exactly. Um, next question. Could you please touch on the evolving geopolitical relationship between Canada and the global south? How do you see this impacting Canada's ambitious economic and energy transition? <laughs> well, um, that's a speech in and of itself. I yes. spend a lot of time outside of Canada. I'm on my way now to Japan and Korea on, on Monday, um, supporting Minister Ng's um, first trade mission, which was originally supposed to be India, India. Uh, this month. Um, look, I think we're in a, in a very difficult geopolitical environment, uh, partly because nature abhors a vacuum. And what we have is a vacuum of global leadership. The withdrawal of the United States of America from many of, of its sort of traditional roles, unless it's forced back into it as has happened uh, very unfortunately in the Middle East, um, has created a free-for-all in, in our global environment. And what you're seeing is a new geopolitics, what I call a, a, a transactional environment, mm -hmm. where um, the loyalties are to yourself and no one else and you can completely rationalize being friends with somebody on one issue and being completely opposed to them on another and you're expecting them to understand. You know, I use India as an example just because I'm familiar with it. You can be a member of Quad, support the United States' agenda on some form of containment of, of, its, uh, of its competition, but you can also buy your gas from Russia because that's, that's what you need to do because no one else can get it to you and you need to give gas to your citizens uh, as cheaply as you can. So we're living in that new era where traditional infrastructure, uh, the architecture of, of uh, G G7, G20, and so forth. I mean, the president of China didn't even come to the G20. Yeah. What does that tell you when the president of China doesn't even show up to the G20? But he meets right? Putin. Yeah. So I think in that world, it's even more important for Canada to have a clear-eyed policy, foreign policy, on how are we going to navigate a very complex geopolitical environment uh, particularly, don't get your way as, as a small country in the way of elephants, as <laughs> giant countries, because you will get crushed along yeah. the way. So we have to be shrewd, we have to be strategic, we have to be pragmatic, we have to play to our strengths, we have to have our eyes wide open. We have a history of being able to do this. We've had some of the finest foreign ministers the world's ever seen, one of whom I worked for in Joe Clark, yeah. right? We have the capacity to do it, but we have to be strategic in how we go doing it. The world is it changed. I use 2015 as an example because that's when our last go this government got elected. It's no longer 2015. It's 2023, yeah. and there's a lot going on. And so we have to like rise up to that moment. I think we can, Annette, and I think part of the reason is we can play to our strengths because we're all the diaspora of some somewhere else. Exactly. We bring knowledge, understanding, relationships, awareness, friendships uh, to help us build these relationships, business to business, nonprofit to nonprofit. And yes, government to government. Absolutely. But the speed of, the, the, speed of the, the way we're going needs adaptation in terms of leadership all over the place. I have a last question from the Monk students. 
You speak about speeding up project approvals, but interprovincial relations make this, this challenging. How can we encourage provinces and territories to work together? Well, isn't you know, that the question? I, I, it is it's a source of great frustration to me because these are family squabbles. Yeah, they are. Right, these are family squabbles. These are, you're fighting with your brothers and sisters or your cousins across the country over the littlest, dumbest things more often than not, yeah. okay? And we're seeing, I think, an unhealthy relationship between our federal government and our provincial governments, and that has preceded in, under different stripes of governments, not an indictment of just one particular government. We have not been very mature as a country. We have been immature as a country, and we fight each other as opposed to coming together. And, you know, I'm, I'm talking about Canada this way. The truth is I talk about North America this way. Mm -hmm. North America needs to be more mature yeah. in how we function as one region so that we're not fighting by America right. battles. What we're saying is by North America. Yeah, that's right. Create strength. Break that block. Create strength in our numbers. You know, the Atlantic, in Atlantic My, Canada, where you're from, yeah. is forced to do that exactly. because of size and scale. Exactly. You can't do it by yourselves. But as you're as small in Canada, yeah. we're small in the rest of the world. Exactly. And so we need to think differently, and we need to work collaboratively and together, and we shouldn't be waiting on courts yep. to tell us these things because courts take their time in doing that. Yep. And time, if there's one message I have for all of us, time's not our friend. No. Like, we just got to wake up to what's going on because the next speech five years from now is made, this one made you feel worried. The next one's not going to be any better in five years yeah. if we go in the direction that we are. But it doesn't have to be this way. I do have one positive thing that I always tell myself every day. Right? They say, how come you, don't, you still get sleep at night? I still get sleep at night because if there's one thing I believe is true, I believe in the collective wisdom of the Canadian people that we are a smart group of people. Yep. And when we are forced to stop thinking about the little stuff and actually think about some big stuff, like we did in the free trade election of 1988, we figure out the right answer and our governments follow or lead the way That's often right. yeah. in doing that. So the message today is it is up to us. Yep. It is up to us. Colleen, do I, can I have one more question? No, one more? Uh, so what can senior business leaders do to drive, to drive this? It can't all be in the C-suite. Air Canada is a company that really understands how to dig deep and get information from their 80 national, nationalities. It's probably one of the most exciting companies, uh, in, certainly in the airline business. But I'll tell you, that's the question we have to ask all senior leaders. Um, we have to figure out a different way to get ownership and inclusion and equity into the decision-making process. And we have to listen and take all the stuff that's in your head and throw it out and open it up to the new ideas that are out there. Otherwise, this is not going to work. I'll tell you that business leaders, you know this well, you're an example of one in that, your own story. Um, they come to succeed. They want to grow their yeah. businesses, they want to compete, and they want to do it globally. And they're, they're ready to do it. But it's hard to do it if your own governments put one hand behind your back and tie it up. Yep. Let's get out of our own way and let's enable success to be achieved because that is what's going to make sure that our next generation has a better quality of life than, than we did. Thank you very much. And I know I said I'd be your host this evening and kind of misspoke, but I could have kept on hearing that discussion until the evening. So thank you both for some really important, really important messages. Um, Goldie, I think the diagnosis was clear, and like our inheritance has made us complacent. Um, but you give us a hopeful, clear message. The, the, the puck is on our stick, and it's really what we choose to do with it. The, the hero and the villain is us, <laughs> and there's action that we can take. And, and, and speaking of action, I really appreciated, Annette, your, uh, your penchant for action, you know, taking aggressive action. Look, let's do some, let's figure it out to 60% and move on, and we'll figure it out, right? And I think we need a lot more of that. So thank you for, on behalf of the club, for your vision, your leadership, and uh, taking the time to share your message with us today. So thank you very much. Before we close, um, I uh, would just like to share two events coming up at the club. On November 7th, we'll host the Honorable Peter Bethenfalvey, Minister of Finance. Maybe take some notes and bring them back uh, to share with him. And on November 14th, Pierre Carpellado, President and CEO of Quebec Corps, will be our guest. 
please visit our website, canadianclub.org, for more information. And let me conclude, again, by thanking our AV sponsor, um, VVC Live, for facilitating today's event. And lastly, our event sponsor today, KPMG, for their support. <laughs> and wonderful introductory remarks, Elio. So thank you, everybody, and have a good afternoon.